Consideration in English law is one of the three main building blocks of a contract. Consideration can be anything of value, which each party to a legally binding contract must agree to exchange if the contract is to be valid. If only one party offers consideration, the agreement is not legally a binding contract. In its traditional form, expressed as a requirement that in order for parties to be able to enforce a promise, they must have given something for it, something must be given or promised in exchange or return for the promise. A contract must be met with, or supported by consideration to be enforceable. Also, only a person who has provided consideration can enforce a contract. In other words, if an arrangement consists of a promise which is not supported by consideration, then the arrangement is not a legally enforceable contract. Mutual promises constitute consideration for each other. In Australia, the bargain theory of consideration prevails, where the act or forbearance of one party or promise thereof is the price for which a promise is bought. Value Consideration for a particular promise exists where some right, interest, profit or benefit accrues to the promiser as a direct result of some forbearance, detriment, loss or responsibility that has been given, suffered or undertaken by the promisee. The consideration must be executory or executed, but not passed. Consideration is executory when a promise to do something in the future is given in exchange for another promise to be done in the future. Consideration is executed when a promise is actually executed, in exchange for another promise to be executed in the future. Consideration is passed when a promise has been given or executed before and independently of the other promise. For example, I promised to take you to lunch, and then when we got there I said you must pay, because I have given you the benefit of my company. This is past consideration and therefore no consideration. Consideration can be anything of value, which each party to a legally binding contract must agree to exchange if the contract is to be valid. If only one party offers consideration, the agreement is not legally a binding contract. In its traditional form, consideration is expressed as the requirement that in order for parties to be able to enforce a promise, they must have given something for it, something must be given or promised in exchange or return for the promise. A contract must be met with, or supported by consideration to be enforceable. Also, only a person who has provided consideration can enforce a contract. In other words, if an arrangement consists of a promise which is not supported by consideration, then the arrangement is not a legally enforceable contract. Mutual promises constitute consideration for each other. In Australia, the bargain theory of consideration prevails, where the act or forbearance of one party or promise thereof is the price for which a promise is bought. Ex nudo pacto actio non orita, Dyer's case 2 Hen 5, 5 PL 26, Lucy v. Wallen KB 27 1026, M. 76. 94 Selden Sock 268, Early Case on the Doctrine of Consideration, Concerning an Executory Contract where the plaintiff recovered damages for the loss of a bargain. Thomas v. Thomas 2 QB 851, White v. Blewett, Blewett, when sued by his Fidera Euro unregistered trademark as executors for an outstanding debt to his father, claimed that his father had promised to discharge him from it in return for him stopping complaining about property distribution. The court held that the cessation of complaints was of no economic value. Thus, Blewett a Euro unregistered trademark s further had received no real consideration for the promise, and the debt was enforceable at law. Curry v. Misa Ella 10x 153, 162, Bolton v. Madden L R 9 QB 55, 56, Blackburn J, a Euro The general rule is that an executory agreement, by which the plaintiff agrees to do something on the terms that the defendant agrees to do something else, may be enforced if what the plaintiff has agreed to do is either for the benefit of the defendant or to the trouble or prejudice of the plaintiff. A Euro unregistered trademark. Dunlop Pneumatic Tire Company Limited v. Selfridge and Company Limited, 1915, AC. 847, 855, Lord Dunedin, an act or forbearance of one party, or the promise thereof, is the price for which the promise of the other is bought and the promise thus given for value is enforceable. 
Lush J and Curry V Mysa L A Ten X C H One Hundred Fifty Three refer to consideration as consisting of a detriment to the promisee or a benefit to the promiser. Some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to one party, or some forbearance, detriment, loss or responsibility given, suffered or undertaken by the other. The definition given by Sir Frederick Pollock, approved by Lord Dunedin in Dunlop v Selfridge Limited, 1915, AC 847, is as follows. An act or forbearance of one party, or the promise thereof, is the price for which the promise of the other is bought, and the promise thus given for value is enforceable. Adequacy, for consideration to be good consideration, it must be of some value, even if it is minimal value. There is no requirement that the consideration be commensurate in economic terms to the original promise. Nominal consideration will suffice as good consideration for a contract, courts will not measure the adequacy of the consideration as it is up to the parties to decide the subjective worth of each promise. Chapel and Company Limited v. Nessel Company Limited, 1960, AC 87, Lord Somerville, a Euro A contracting party can stipulate for what consideration he chooses. A peppercorn does not cease to be good consideration if it is established that the promiser does not like pepper and will throw away the corn a Euro unregistered trademark. Past conduct, a promise cannot be based upon consideration that was said, given or done after the promise was performed. Something said afterwards, will not count as consideration. For example, if X promises to reward Y for an act that Y had already performed then while the performance of that act is good consideration, for the promise to be rewarded for it is past consideration and therefore not good consideration. In Eastwood v Kenyon, the guardian of a young girl raised a loan to educate the girl and to improve her marriage prospects. After her marriage, her husband promised to pay off the loan. It was held that the guardian could not enforce the promise as taking out the loan to raise and educate the girl was past consideration, because it was completed before the husband promised to repay it. Furthermore, where a contract exists between two parties and one party, subsequent to formation, promises to confer an additional benefit on the other party to the contract, that promise is not binding because the promisee's consideration, which is his entry into the original contract, had already been completed at the time the next promise is made. In Roscola v. Thomas, Roscola and Thomas contracted to buy a horse for a £30. After the sale, Thomas promised Roscola that the horse was sound. The horse turned out to be vicious. It was held that Roscola could not enforce the promise, as the consideration given for entering into the contract to buy the horse had been completed by the time the promise was made. In a sense, the consideration was used up. The rule that past consideration is not good consideration is subject to the exception discussed by the Privy Council in Pau on v Lao Yulong. In that case, their lordships held that past consideration can be good consideration where, the promisee performed the original act at the request of the promiser. It was clearly understood or implied between the parties that the promisee would be rewarded for the performance of the act. The actual promise made if made before the promisee provided the consideration, must be capable of being enforced, in other words giving rise to a legally binding contract. Illusory consideration, there must be some kind of connection between a promise and the consideration offered to support the promise. It is no consideration to refrain from a course of conduct which it was never intended to pursue. The consideration must have been at least an inducement to enter into the promise equals for bearing to sue equals, Kaulisha v. Bischoff Shimel R5 QB 449, forbearance to sue in a groundless action still good consideration. Honest mistake. Privity. A promise is enforceable if it is supported by consideration, that is, where consideration has moved from the promisee. For example, in the case of Tweddell v. Atkinson. John Tweddell promised William Guy that he would pay a sum of money to the child of William Guy, and likewise William Guy promised John Tweddell that he would pay a sum of money to the child of John Tweddell, upon the marriage of the two children to each other. However, William Guy failed to pay the son of John Tweddell, who then sued his executors for the amount promised. It was held that the son could not enforce the promise made to his father, as he himself had not actually given consideration for it 
it was his father who had done so instead. The son didn't receive any consideration, so he cannot enforce the promise. This particular rule of consideration forms the basis of the doctrine of privity of a contract, that is, only a party to a contract is permitted to sue upon that contract's terms. Act 1999. Therefore consideration from the promisee was indulgent of the claim. Although consideration must move from the promisee, it does not necessarily have to move to the promiser. The promisee may provide consideration to a third party, if this is agreed at the time the party is contracted. The offeree must provide consideration, although the consideration does not have to flow to the offerer. For example, it is good consideration for person A to pay person C in return for services rendered by person B. If there are joint promises, then consideration need only to move from one of the promises. Pre-existing duties, if the promisee provides what he was required by public law to do in any event in return for a promise, promised performance of existing duty is not good consideration. In Collins v. Godfrey, Godfrey promised to pay Collins for his giving of evidence. It was held that Collins could not enforce the promise as he was under a statutory duty to give evidence in any event. However, if the promisee provides more than what public duty imposes on him, then this is good consideration. In Ward v. Boehm a mother was under a statutory duty to look after her child. The ex-husband promised to pay her a one pound a week if she ensured that the child was well looked after and happy. It was held that notwithstanding the statutory duty imposed on the mother, she could enforce the promise since the act of keeping the baby happy provided additional consideration. Glassbrook Limited v. Glamorgan County Council, 1925, AC 270, promising to perform a pre-existing duty owed to one's contracting party also fails to make good consideration. However this rule has been considerably narrowed by recent case law. The general rule is that if a creditor promises to discharge a debt in return for a fraction of payment, in paying the agreed fraction, the promisee is not providing consideration for the promise, as this is merely part performance of a contractual duty already owed. Consequently, the debtor is still liable for the whole amount, as he cannot force the promiser to accept less. A leading example is in Steelk v. Myrique. Steelk, a seaman, agreed with Myrique to sail his boat to the Baltic Sea and back for a five pounds per month. During the voyage, two men deserted. Myrique promised he would increase Steelk's wages if Steelk agreed to honor his contract in light of the desertions. Steelk agreed and on return to port, Myrique refused to pay him the extra wages. It was held that Myrique's fresh promise was not enforceable as the consideration Steelk had provided for it, the performance of a duty he already owed to Myrique under contract, was not good consideration for Myrique's promise to increase his wages. Initially, there were only two exceptions to this rule, Hansen v. Royden, the promisee has done, or has promised to do, more than he was obliged to do under his contract. Hartley v. Ponsonby before the fresh promise was made, circumstances had arisen which would have entitled a promisee to refuse to carry out his obligations under his contract. Equals factual benefits equals, however, the strictness of this rule was severely limited in Williams v. Roffey Brothers and Nichols Limited. The Roffey brothers entered into a contract to refurbish a block of flats for a fixed price of a £20,000. They subcontracted carpentry work to Williams. It became apparent that Williams was threatened by financial difficulties and would not be able to complete his work on time. This would have breached a term in the main contract, incurring a penalty. Roffey brothers offered to pay Williams an additional a £575 for each flat completed. Williams continued to work on this basis, but soon it became apparent that Roffey Brothers were not going to pay the additional money. He ceased work and sued Roffey Brothers for the extra money, for the eight flats he had completed after the promise of additional payment. The Court of Appeal held that Roffey Brothers must pay Williams the extra money, as they had enjoyed practical benefits from the promise they had made to Williams. The benefits they received from it include, having the work completed on time, not having to spend money in time seeking another carpenter and not having to pay the penalty. In the circumstances, these benefits were sufficient to provide consideration for the promise made to Williams of additional payment. 
it now seems that the performance of an existing duty may constitute consideration for a new promise, in the circumstances where no duress or fraud are found and where the practical benefits are to the promiser. The performance of an existing contractual duty owed to the promiser is not good consideration for a fresh promise given by the promiser. However, performance of an existing contractual duty owed to a third party can be good consideration, see further below. According to the Court of Appeal, it is unlikely that either avoiding a breach of contract with a third party, avoiding the trouble and expense of engaging a third party to carry out work or avoiding a penalty clause in a third party contract will be a practical benefit. In Simon Container Machinery Limited v Ember Machinery AB, the practical benefit was held to be the avoiding of a breach of contract, which was clearly not an extension of the principle. This is true unless the debtor provided fresh consideration for the promise. The following, mentioned in Pinnell's case itself and confirmed by Sibri v. Trip, may amount to fresh consideration, if the promisee offers part payment earlier than full payment was due, and this is of benefit to the creditor. If the promisee offers part payment at a different place than where full payment was due, and this is of benefit to the creditor. Or, if the promisee pays the debt in part by another chattel. Another exception is that part payment of the debt by a third party as consideration for a promise to discharge the creditor from the full sum, prevents the creditor then suing the debtor for full payment. The Court of Appeal in Reselect Move Limited stated that the practical benefit doctrine arising from Williams v. Roffey cannot be used as an additional exception to the rule. In that case, it was held that the doctrine only applies where the original promise was a promise to pay extra and not to pay less. It should be noted, however, that the Court of Appeal in Reselect Move were unable to distinguish folks v. Beer, in order to apply Williams v. Roffey. It therefore remains to be seen whether the House of Lords would decide this point differently. In any event, the equitable principle of promissory estoppel may provide the debtor with relief. Atlas Express Limited v. Kafko, 1989, QB 833. Equals existing duties to third parties equals, consideration for a promise can be the performance of a contractual duty owed to someone other than the promiser. In Shadwell, Shadwell was under a contractual duty with a third party to marry. Shadwell a Euro unregistered trademark s uncle promised to pay him a £150 per year after he was married. It was held that Shadwell marrying was good consideration, notwithstanding that he was obliged by a contract with a third party to marry in any event. A promise to perform a pre-existing contractual duty owed to a third party may also amount to consideration. Shadwell v. Shadwell 9 CBNS 159. 42ER62, New Zealand Shipping Company Limited v. A. M. Satterthwaite and Company Limited, 1975, AC154. Estoppel. High Trees Case, 1947, KB 130, Hughes v. Metropolitan Railway Company 2 APCAS 439, DNC Builders v. Reese. 1966, 2QB 617, Ogilvy v. Hope Davis, 1976, 1 Olia 683, Coombe v. Coombe, 1951, 2 Kilobytes 215, Reselect Move Limited, 1995, 1WLR 474, Collier v. P. and M. J. Wright Limited, 2007, EWCA Civ 1329, Walton Stores v. Mayhaw 164 CLR. 387, Crab v. Arun District Council, 1976, 1 CH 170, Avon County Council v. Howlett, 1983, WLR 603, a person can be stopped from denying what he said in a representation. Deeds and Formality, Law of Property Act 1989 Section 1. Alternatives. Carlyle v. Carbolic Smoke Ball Company, 1893, 1QB 256, A.L. Smith L.J., a Euro I understand that if there is no consideration for a promise, it may be a promise in honor, or a new them pactum. But if anything else is meant, I do not understand it. I do not understand what a bargain or a promise or an agreement in honor is unless it is one on which an action cannot be brought because it is new them pactum. In my judgment, 
this first point fails, and this was an offer intended to be acted upon, and, when acted upon and the conditions performed, constituted a promise to pay a Euro unregistered trademark, Anton's Trawling Company Limited v. Smith, 2003, 2 and ZLR 23, Baragwinath J., a Euro. The importance of consideration is as a valuable signal that the parties intend to be bound by their agreement, rather than an end in itself. Where the parties who have already made such intention clear by entering legal relations have acted upon an agreement to a variation, in the absence of policy reasons to the contrary, they should be bound by their agreement a Euro unregistered trademark, Unidroit Principles Article 2.1.2 and 3.2. See also, English Contract Law. Notes. References. J. H. Baker. Origins of the Doctrine of Consideration 1535-1585 and J. H. Baker, The Legal Profession and the Common Law, Historical Essays. External links